Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Communication Exploration Podcast. My name is Maria. My name is Aileen. My name is Isaac. I'm Chris. And I'm Jessa. So, at the beginning of this semester, our first lecture presented the statement, technology makes us more connected than ever before. Upon initially hearing this, the statement seems obviously true. Today, with the technology we have, we can instantaneously send texts, photos, and videos to anyone, anywhere. But just because communication has become easier, does it really mean we're more connected? In this podcast, Communication Exploration, we'll be diving deeper into the topic of communications in the digital era, and how technology both connects and separates us from each other. For those of you who don't know, as defined by IGI Global, the digital era is considered the period in which society has shifted from the industrial revolution into a new economic domination of information technology. This growth of technological advancements is very recent, only really taking off in the past decade or two. And as the generation born in the early 2000s, we've really seen and experienced this cultural shift in our own upbringings. So thinking back to it, when was your first experience with technology? So my first experience was with my older sister's purple flip phone that I would steal from her and I'd play those like little brick games. Um, And that was the first time I got to experience like what it's like using technology that wasn't like a TV or like the home phone. uh, So my first experience was probably like VHS and like watching like old movies and TV shows. I remember watching a lot of like uh, anime like Pokemon or like (laughs) Yu-Gi-Oh on VHS. And then I remember like Back in the day, you would have to actually like rewind the VHS if you wanted to watch it over again. And then uh, people would get really annoyed if you didn't rewind it. But now that's just like completely obsolete. It's just gone from, from today's technology. So before your first cell phone, how would you contact your friends and family? Um, I honestly would not. The only contact I had was writing notes. <laughs> like my mom would write notes and put it in my lunch bag, like classic mom making lunch behavior. And also... Um, in school, I remember like your agenda would be a really big deal and like having your parents sign your agenda and like teachers would communicate with your parents through your agenda and writing notes. So that was like a very old school thing that we used to do. Yeah, I feel like it definitely was like culturally just very different. The only way you could really talk to like your friends and family, especially when we were younger, was you just had to be around them. For sure. Um, and I remember also, like, there was, like, rarely, you know, like, some family member would, like, call on the home phone and, like, your mom or whatever, or dad would be like, come on down, like, grandma's on the phone or whatever, and you'd, like, have to come down and... Yeah, or, like, listening into your family's conversations on the other phone. True, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember one time I did that, and I thought I was, like, being sneaky, and then, but this was my sister, and then my sister, like, after the call, and she's like, why, why were you listening to my call? My call? And I was like, how can you tell? Like, oh, you can tell by the breathing. But I was like a little kid. I was like a stupid kid, so. It's hard to believe that the generations before us didn't have this ease of access to technology that we are so fortunate to have. Before the mobile phone, contact could be only made while at home, tethered to a single spot where the landline was accessible from. And before that, the fastest way to get a message to someone was to tell them in person. The technology we have today makes communication so much easier, but it could be arguably be considered too easy. With the development of the smartphone also came the rise of social media. Platforms like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and so on have opened up a whole new world of communication. And with it, it's sort of its own culture. So do you guys use social media? Um, Definitely, I'm on social media a lot. Uh, There was historically a time when I was like on Twitter, but I don't really use that anymore. I don't like that app very much, but definitely a lot of my time is spent on Instagram and TikTok. Um, Yeah, so I use a lot of social media. The main ones I would say are like Twitter and TikTok, where you just like endlessly scroll through the posts every single minute of the day. And I remember the first um, social media that I ever used was Facebook when I was um, pretty young and um, I just thought it was so cool that you could just like easily make friends or like add your friends that you know in person and like instantly message them there. Alright so I'm actually like the opposite, I I, like don't really use social media, Uh, I used to use like Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram but I stopped in like 2020. And then, so now I basically just use only like text messaging apps, so like Messenger and iMessage. And I feel like for me personally, it just like saves a lot of time and I like compare myself less with other people. So it's just like helpful to my mental health. Do you find it harder to communicate to people, especially in like 
group settings, if you have to meet up with a group of people, or if you're doing a group project where you don't necessarily know all these people's phone numbers. Yeah, it can be a bit more like annoying. Like even like this term, like for this group project, I had to like download WhatsApp just to join this group chat for the group project. But yeah, it is kind of annoying. But I think like I think like the pros outweigh the cons. It's just like one less thing to check, sort of, for me, and then like helps me focus better. So there's a cartoon called "The Evolution of Communication" that's posted by the Denver Post, and it shows how humans have evolved from our first written words to Twitter, with movable type, mass publication, and email in between. What's interesting about this cartoon is that the newest evolution of communication, which shows a person tweeting on Twitter, says. 140 characters. What more is there to say? So, what do you think this says about how our communication has evolved over time?、Um, I definitely think that、uh, it says a lot about how, as we go deeper and deeper into this like age of social media, people、um, seem to have like shorter and shorter tolerances for the amount of information they're willing to consume, or not the amount, but the size of each piece of information. You know. There was a time when, like, most people were watching like YouTube, and the videos were a bit longer. They were like, however many minutes. But now, a lot of people will like scroll on TikTok, and it'll be like, if there's like a three-minute video, people will be like, I can't watch that. That's like so <laughs> so long.、Um, and of course, like Twitter, you know, as it said in that cartoon, like it's only like well, I think it's 280 characters now, but it's like communication is getting a lot more bite-sized. Um, I agree. I think that our attention span has been like conditioned to only want to look at things for a short amount of time and like over and over and over again. So as you said, like TikTok is a really big part of that because if a video is over like 30 seconds, like people are just gonna scroll past it. Like no one cares about what we have to say if it's longer than 30 seconds anymore. And then we're just on to the next, and we don't even remember what the last person was talking about. Yeah. So going off of what Maria said.、Um... I definitely think like there's a lot of reflection to it when you think about wow we really spend like this much time just going through social media but each thing we see is like a maximum of 140 characters so like even though it's such like a small like snippet of words or such a short TikTok like it still manages to consume so much of our time. While social media platforms can be credited for creating a space for many beneficial conversations and connections such as the hashtag #MeToo movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. Online communication sparks a lot of discourse for many reasons, specifically in the culture and customs that have risen from their widespread use. Having the internet at the touch of our fingertips, although helpful, does have negative consequences. One of them being technology addiction. We can so seamlessly indulge in online spaces so much that it affects our existence in the real world. This dependency on technology is especially prevalent in younger generations, as they have been exposed to the culture for the majority of their life. Most importantly, during their formative years, a study by the American Psychological Association observed that some adolescents become so involved with certain applications of the internet that they are no longer capable of controlling their online activity, implying that these youngsters have developed symptoms of compulsive internet use, also referred to in literature as internet addiction, problematic internet use, pathological internet use, and internet dependence. So, how do you think this exposure to, to technology and social media during formative years will affect the social skills of adolescents?、Um, I think that internet addiction、um, in these young adolescents is a really real problem, and I think that people mostly call them like iPad kids, and that's like a big topic that's going around. And、um, although it's funny, I really think it has a lot of truth and meaning in the words because all these kids who are growing up now have. They don't have any experience prior to technology. Like they just grow up with technology, and they have games on iPads and on computers that help them learn. So it's like an outlet ever since you're small to go on social media or use it for like school, and、um, it's just going to be a big part of their lives because they've never had a time without it, and everything that they know and want to know is going to be on technology. So I think internet addiction is going to cause a lot of problems for these kids growing up.、Uh, one thing that social media does do really well is overloading us with information. We are constantly getting fed new information with each scroll we make, and if we ever get bored with that information, we know that there will be something new waiting to entertain us with just a flick of our finger. Uh, as a result of this information overload, many of us are easily bored when we're holding a conversation with another human being in real life. 
As a blog by the University of the People stated, people have such a need for social media consumption and that instant colorful feedback only social media can give. They'll often become bored during real conversations, resorting to their phones. In-person conversations may not be able to keep up with the speed that people are usually used to when scrolling through social media and may oftentimes include awkward silences that might feel uncomfortable so people end up resorting to their phones for comfort in the end. And with this world of technology being so new, there are a lot of learning curves to get through. Whether that be learning how to have a healthy balance with life and technology or how we utilize it. While giving people the freedom of speech is important, many problems arise when that freedom of speech is used to attack or harm others, for example with racist or homophobic comments. Reality is the internet is filled with discriminatory messages and posts. And once these sort of things are posted, they live on the internet for pretty much forever. However, having our words permanently archived on the internet can be beneficial in some ways. For example, as highlighted throughout the writings of Tara Conley's hashtag feminism, the internet allows us to preserve stories in an indexable digital space, specifically concerning the stories minority groups such as black and non-white queer women, femme and trans people have. The internet creates a space that provides these groups with a voice where they can speak out on social justice issues in ways that may not be able to or may not be safe to speak out on in the real world. The bigger issue we've come to see with having an accessible archive of posts is the rise of cancel culture. In the late 2010s to the early 2020s, cancel culture was a phrase used by many online users. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, this refers to a mass withdrawal of support from public figures and celebrities who have done things that aren't socially acceptable. The issue is that, however, as the years progress, so does what we consider to be socially acceptable. Today, social media is littered with all sorts of funny videos, tweets, memes, etc. While a lot of these memes play into discriminatory ideologies such as homophobia, misogyny, racism, and so on, they are often widely accepted on the internet. As mentioned in the article, creating clever internet memes perpetuates offensiveness. A humorous context prompts a non-serious mindset for how recipients interpret messages. The humorous context signals a norm of tolerance for prejudice and discrimination. The use and normalization of memes on the internet have blurred the lines of what is considered discriminatory and what's considered a joke, complicating the way we communicate with others, both online and offline. So do you guys think that cancel culture is healthy or necessary? I think that it's kind of like a multifaceted issue, uh, not exactly black or white, because the term cancel culture is used to describe like a broad range of behaviors and phenomena. Uh, I think that like, you know, people being held accountable for uh, like bad actions, you know, Me Too movement and all that, people will describe that as cancel culture. But I think that is a really necessary um, thing. But I do think that also, on the other hand, sometimes people will be too, like, very quick to try and just, like, completely destroy someone for something that maybe wasn't that bad. So I think that, all in all, it's, it's got a lot of positives, but, you know, it's not entirely black and white. I totally agree. I think that cancel culture is a really big part of celebrities' lives, and I think that they believe that they can get away with anything they they do or have done so i think that cancel culture makes them own up to the things that they do in a way that they wouldn't normally have done that in the past or they wouldn't think that they would have to but at the same time um destroying someone's entire life over something they did like 10 years ago if they've learned from that i it's also not right aside from social media there are many ways that technology has changed the way the world around us works which has especially been noticeable with and since the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to the rapid spread of the coronavirus, society had to quickly adapt to living in isolation. And so came the rise of remote learning and work. Even after lockdown restrictions had been lifted, we continue to see these hybrid structures prevail. A survey conducted by Gallup in June of 2022 found that eight in 10 people are working hybrid or remotely, leaving only two in 10 being fully on site. Communication technology has become so advanced that we are now able to accomplish most of our learning and work without even having, having to leave the comfort of our homes. And while no commute and even loose work schedule structure does sound appealing, it's important to know that other implications that may result from hybrid work and education. According to a 2021 survey by Cadence, over two thirds of younger workers say that they have found it harder to make friends or maintain relationships with their colleagues since beginning to work remotely. It's clear that the move to remote work has come at a cost, with many employees facing increased social isolation. 
This lack of connection has been associated with a general decrease in mental health, as stated in a study by Plus One. People spend a large portion of their lives in the workplace, so it's no surprise that the connections they form there have a large impact. This is an issue that is going to, to need to be addressed one way or another in the coming years, as it seems that remote and hybrid work is here to stay in at least, in at least some capacity. It seems inevitable that digital communication platforms will only continue to increase as people feel isolated when working from home. Prior to the pandemic, the messaging and voice chat platform Discord uh, was a sort of niche platform aimed towards and used by like online gamers. Um, however, over the uh, over the pandemic, uh, the app exploded in popularity, uh, nearly tripling its active user base from 56 million to 140 million between 2019 and 2021. Um, the user base has also diversified significantly, with many users unconnected to the gaming world now using the platform to connect over other interests, including sports, investing, dating, and more. Meta uh, has also been attempting to bridge this social gap with the metaverse, uh, with a stated goal of creating virtual online spaces for work, play, and more uh, that simulate and even enhance aspects of real life. Uh, whether or not these specific platforms will guide us through our virtual future, it is clear that people and companies are increasingly trying to recreate and simulate the vital face-to-face -face interactions that we are losing with our increasingly online lives. So we were just talking about uh, the effect that online work uh, is having on people's lives, and now I imagine most of us haven't worked online jobs, um, but did you find that uh, especially last year and during the pandemic, taking mostly online classes, was it a positive or a negative experience for you? And do you think it had any effects on your mental health and or social life? Um, personally, I found that online, I actually liked online classes more last year because it felt like, um, it didn't feel as tiring as like going into in-person classes, but I felt like the effects of my mental health and like social life it was very hard to like make friends with those people when we're in like breakout rooms or when we're all just listening to the professor going on about their lectures. Um, and it was kind of hard because we were always stuck indoors. Personally for me, I kind of see school as sort of like the whole experience of it, like going to class, getting to hang out and talk to your friends and even just getting to see other people. So when it was all shifted to online, it was definitely just like mentally sort of weird for me to wrap my head around. It kind of just felt more like going to class was like a chore. You kind of just would sit at my desk in my room, log into my laptop, watch a video, and then close my laptop, go about my day. It really wasn't any sort of experience. And I feel like there was also just a big lack of like connection to the content, to like the teachings, and even just to everyone in the class around you. I also found that it was really hard to retain information. I would look at pre-recorded lectures at like twice the speed because I just wanted to get done with it faster. And I, it was like really weird. I felt like every time a, the professor would like take a breath or like, I don't know, explain something really long. Like it, I just didn't have time for it. Like I always wanted to make it go super fast. And this makes me think of all the kids who are also in school, but who are in elementary school and had to learn um, how to read and write. Um, through Zoom calls and a lot of these kids have gaps in their learning and they are really behind and they also don't know what it's like to be in a classroom setting because their whole class time was just fully virtual. Okay, so I've actually like worked remote um, and I'd say that like in terms of my mental health, it was actually a lot better than having to go in the office and like, the main reason is because I didn't have to commute and so like uh, when I was interning, like the commute would be like two hours one way where I would have to like bus and then transfer and then bus again. So that would take a, like a huge chunk of my day. And then when I get home, it would be like super late and I feel like I would have no time left to do anything. And just, yeah, I would feel a lot more like happy, you know, just working at home in the comfort of my room. But on the other hand, actually, I think for school, when it's online, it's a lot worse because as like everyone else has mentioned, uh, it's like a lot harder to make friends. And I think especially as a first year, if you're starting university uh, fresh, like having online school would be a lot more bearable if you had already made friends and then had to do online school. But if you had to start fresh, it's like a lot more difficult and it's like basically impossible to actually make any meaningful connections. 
Wow, what a great discussion, you guys. Well, on that note, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in to Communication Exploration.